Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this, the next session. We're, we're running slightly late, but I think that's um, not so much to, down to our, our efficiency, more to um, the, the interest generated by the speakers. Um, we, we're, we're moving forward for, uh, on from just simple things like twiddling radiator valves, which I must admit don't seem simple to me, but that's me. Um, and so I'm delighted to um, welcome our, our next panellists. Um, We've got, um, starting from on our right, Dan Chambers, a local resident who's about to start his low carbon future and is, is here really to ask a few simple questions. Um, the other panellists, you, you will have seen their bios, etc. Um, but um, I'm del delighted to welcome um, from Ferb now and with a long history, well not long, but a, 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 a modest but a, a, but appreciable history behind you in the retrofit business, Becky Lane, and on on my right from Manchester, uh, Charlie Baker, Red Co-op, and Better Homes now. Your home better. Your home better. I get, yeah. always get it confused. And if you wonder why I've got the dancing shoes on, it's because I cycled here. He did cycle. So <laughs> got here in very good time. Very impre very impressive too. So. Dan, you're about to start your journey. Yes, I'd say I think like a lot of people, uh, for a few years so we've been looking at we've had cavity wall insulation, we've done some good things with our lock insulation, change all the light bulbs, we've done a lot of those easier level things, and we're now looking to sort of essentially decarbonise our energy economy in our house. We currently use 4,500 kilowatts a year of which about 90% are gas central heating. So we're looking at generating our own electricity. So it's a big step. It's, uh, for anybody, it's a big investment. And we're looking at the trying to find the information required to make the right decisions. There are plenty of people out there advertising services. We could get three people to come around and quote us. But I think it's important that we have at least some good guidance, independent guidance, as to things like the sort of levels of energy usage we're going to require, the size of battery we might require, the, the choices, the relative choices between different brands and sizes of solar panels, that sort of information, which I think as a consumer, I've got some money I'm willing to spend, and I'm anxious that there are a lot of people there who are trying to get it off me. A lot of them are honest, a lot of them are straight. But it's a very new industry, and it's an anxious. I think it's. I think for a lot of people who want to make that step, I want to decarbonise my house. But I, the, the guidance side is the problem we have, um, and also the nature of the process. Clearly, we could have a whole lot done in one go. But like as, as Nick was saying with his uh, retrofit aspects earlier. I don't want to invest in the wrong sort, the wrong arrangement for my solar and battery. That means that when we get a, uh, an air source heat pump, or we're looking to car charging, or something like that, that all has to, the original stuff has to be changed again. All that information about whether things are going to be compatible, how plug and play is the, are these systems? That's what makes me anxious about making that step. And either district councils need to supply that information national organisations, independent organisations, need to make that information. I, I don't feel I can trust people who are necessarily the people who are going to sell me those services. What's important is the general information for people to be able to feel confident in making a move. And I'm in a position where I own my house, I've got a rough idea what's going on, I'm anxious about the carbon and the climate. I want to make that change but I don't want to blow 15,000 quid on the system <coughs> if it's not going to work or if it's not, not got these good warranties, not got good backup, all that sort of thing. Um, and I would be interested to know how spokesmen for the industry, essentially, or what they can do to give me that confidence in what they're supplying me. Thanks, Dan. I, I think that's that's pretty clear. Um, well, step forward. Someone, like I say, with a track record of independent advice. Thanks, 
so much done. And I was reflecting on this earlier as well, it's like great presentations uh, from Nick and Graham going into so much detail. But for many people in the room, you probably come here today, like Dan, yeah. what am I going to do next? Where am I going to invest in my home? Um, and as um, I was introduced, I previously worked at West Midlands Combined Authority, uh, where we looked at trying to build a similar kind of service. It's called a retrofit one-stop shop. I know Charlie will probably talk about this a little bit, what they've built in Manchester. But no, unfortunately, I'm leaving the thunder entirely for you, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a different slideshow. Okay. Um, but in the West Midlands, there's still quite a lot of work to do on the political side, getting the budgets ready to provide such a service that would be independent. So, hence why I've set up Ferb now, which is this independent survey service for those who are not eligible for grants. So, there are grant programmes that are available at the moment. Um, I know that will be sp spoken about later from Gillian. Um, and EK Plus as well will mean that more <laughs> homeowners will be eligible for grant funds. But there's still huge waves of people that are looking to make serious investments into the home like you're doing. Um, but the advice just simply isn't there. But there is a lot of infrastructure that is in place to provide such a service, but the kind of company which we've built isn't really in place or operating at scale. So what we do at Ferb now is we follow the PAS 2035 process, which some people will be familiar with that, some people less. First of all, we give you a whole, ho whole home plan. We do a whole home energy assessment. There's kind of like what Nick and Graham were talking about. Look at the home, look at the building material, what's the condition, looking at the ventilation strategy. And what we do is we make sure that it doesn't matter which retrofit coordinator that comes around to your home, these are the professionals that we employ to go to your home. You get the same standard of service. So the report looks the same. We also don't provide you a 50-page PDF and hope that you've got a Masters in Building Physics to understand uh, what to do as well. So we've purposely built it customer first so you have the best chance of succeeding and understanding where to put the investment in your home. So that's the first step. First step. So hopefully that helps a little bit with the, the independence. Um, and also how we've built the business model as well as we don't rely on any um, referrals or payments from any installers. Um, purposely built in that way to make sure that the way we make money doesn't incentivize us to push you down a certain route because I recognize this independence and transparency is so important to make sure you feel empowered to make the right decision. Um, so once you've got your home energy plan um, and roughly it recommends a few stages so fabric first looking at ventilation um, you can look at which stages to do first as well that might make most sense to give you the best thermal comfort first that is a priority for you. Secondly, looking at energy generation, and then lastly, looking at transitioning into low carbon heating. So that's roughly speaking the, the roadmap for your home that we recommend. Um, and then you can chunk that into what you're willing to invest in first. So there's no dependency investing in renewable energy, so if you wanted to do solar battery first, no dependency at all. But if you wanted to jump straight to a heat pump, we would definitely recommend investing in your energy efficiency and ventilation first before making that jump. Um, and when you're ready to take the jump, you pick the package, that suits your budget. Uh, we currently don't offer a finance product, but we're working on that at the moment, so we're looking to provide that towards the end of this year. Um, and there's a couple of services that we do help with as well. So obviously, once you've got that plan, you can DIY, find your own installers, uh, but we recognise how tricky that can be. And Dan, maybe if you've done some of that work as well, it'd be good to hear your um, reflections on starting to find some of those installers. Not got to that yet. Not yet. Um, <laughs> But we've kind of built three project services around this. So DIY, go ahead. We can put you in touch with our accredited installers. Some of those are from Trustmark, uh, which was mentioned earlier. There are also other accreditation bodies as well, which don't require that past 2030. It's, it's quite difficult to get that accreditation. There's not that many insulation installers or window installers are actually past 2030 accredited. So we, go, we do the work for you. We look at the accreditation bodies that we know are really good, that properly survey the work that installers have done, not just have a checkbox exercise, um, and we can put you in touch with those. The second offer we provide is called Project Support. So you might not need something so heavy-handed. You probably just need a bit of advice. A retrofit coordinator will do this hundreds of times or thousands, as Graham has uh, done in the past. But you might do this once or twice in your life with your home. So project support is advice around the quotes. Does that look right for the market value at the moment? Secondly is around the detailed design, how these measures integrate, particularly for doing it in a step-by-step -step approach. And then third um, is making sure that the installers as well have, have the accreditation if you've gone with your own installers, um, just to make sure that you're feeling very confident in the decision that you've made and the installers that you're choosing yourself. 
We can also provide site visits on top of that as well, but that is an additional cost that bakes in just because it's quite intense. <coughs> that just means if you're having a problem with your installer and you're not sure if you have the ability to debate with them and say that's not quite the right thing to do, this retrofit coordinator can come in and make sure that they are giving you the independent advice. So that's a little bit lighter, but it gives you um, some more help in taking that journey. It would be good to get your feedback down if that sounds like something would be useful. Um, and then the third one that we provide is way more involved, and obviously with it comes costs, as full project support. So the retrofit coordinator takes on all of the project management for you. They'll make sure the installers are scheduled on time. They'll manage the um, installation on the site. And basically just take away a lot of the hassle that goes around with, um, I know Nick, you might imagine from what Nick was talking about, taking the plaster off, maybe um, coordinating several trades over the course of a few weeks. Um, but obviously that's a little bit more involved. So those are the services that we currently provide um, in the West and East Midlands, and we're looking to expand um, further beyond in the next few months as well. But that's the core of it. Um, beyond that as well, in the future, we're building a monitoring service as well, which basically, once you've done the work, did it work? Um, and gives you that confidence if you've done it in stages. If you've invested, you're saying 15,000, maybe you could break it into five and then 10 over a few years. Um, you can figure out whether that first investment did the work, did the job that it was meant to, and then you can help make a decision for that staging uh, with the incremental retrofit, as we think most people will do this, because it's quite tricky to do one deep retrofit in one stage. I, I've just got a couple of questions, actually, if, uh, unless you have, Dan, on that. So, is there essentially, because um, especially with the more intensive um, parts of your offering, which you went on to describe, <coughs> i.e. for project management effectively, um, they cost money. Is there enough value, as it were, in the retrofits, potential value in the whole retrofits process, that you, as a company, can extract value in the form of fees, yet still give back value, i.e. money saved? Yeah, exactly. So we wouldn't recommend a full retrofit, full retrofit service if you were doing a five grand installation, for example. Um, when we would normally recommend that service is if you're doing very significant. So deep, the whole plan in one go, you're going to do a solid wall installation, you're going to do loft, you're going to do your suspended floor, probably looking at solar panels. So that means that you've got several trades working together um, in, in a few weeks. That's when the value, when it's really valuable. And I would look at like what's a kind of analogous industry where you would compare this mm -hmm. would be kind of an extension or remodeling your home. It's the value of an architect in that process and helping you plan forward, put the project management together and manage that. <coughs> That's when we would recommend something like a <coughs> project management system um, rather than kind of a smaller thing like an individual measure like just doing cavity wall or just doing loft insulation, which is obviously far cheaper but also less complex. It's when you're in practice on site having to manage several kind of integration points and we've heard about thermal bridges which might be new for some people today as well is making sure that those are mitigated on site as it gets built so you're not creating issues in the future and dan dan mentioned um, two things one re one stop retrofit also potentially advice from the district council if um zz from hope valley climate action had man had not been ill and made it today she would have talked about her ideas for um, developing one-stop retrofit um, in in the High Peak and, and the other parts of the Hope Valley. Um, do you view those potential sources of advice and guidance as competitors to you or com complementary? For me it's collaborators. Um, so the way I see it is that smaller groups that are looking to set this up community groups, so for example, Moreland's Climate Action, if you wanted to look at setting up something like this, which might be very much in the future, there's a lot of... Don't let me hear anything. <laughs> I'll be calling you. There's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built behind the scenes to make this work. So for a small organisation, um, just some very business, basic business things, CRMs, how the customer services management have it managed, have enough resource to deal with customer requirements, that's just on the customer side then you've got supplier management recruiting them making sure you're giving them enough demand predictably as well and growing that to keep them engaged and, and delivering a high quality of service and then there's quality management there's so many elements of building a retrofit one-stop shop which means for a small charity organization it would be difficult to invest in those so hence with what we're building with Ferb now a lot of our strategies about building um, a really great quality of service for customers but also looking to collaborate with communities, 
charities, um, particularly organisations like this, local authorities as well, to provide that infrastructure to help deliver um, the service to customers, but also that view for the supply chain as well to help grow demand gently over time and um, provide more work for the supply chain so they can also grow their capacity. We haven't really spoken about that. There's some supply no. chain issues as well, which needs to be taken into account. Well, absolutely. Well, let's let's just briefly touch on it, because I know Charlie has some strong views on skills and supply chain. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that is not true. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but um, the, we, we all know that there are issues in both in skills base and, and the supply chain, too linked, of course. Um, how bad is it? Um, <laughs> so we've so there's kind of a few groups of suppliers that we that we work with. One is uh, retrofit assessors and coordinators, and you might have think them as surveyors, kind of similar to Rick surveyors, who might have done a home buyer report for you before you completed on the purchase of your home. Um, awesome. Um, Graham mentioned earlier the kind of retrofit assessor with capital R, capital A. Um, that's a formal qualification um, which is provided by the Retrofit Academy, which is incidentally just a couple of stops down the M6. Mm. Um, they're not very far away, and they're leading on training um, those those um, surveyors across the country. So what we found is that as the number of people who are available to do retrofit assessments and coordinate, uh, retrofit coordination has boomed, particularly in the last. Um, in the last year because there's been so much funding available for training. Um, so if anyone's thinking about a career move, there's a lot of free funding available to do those training sessions um, and kind of move through the ranks of uh, retrofit advisor, assessor, and then coordinator so you're actually able to provide these services yourself. Um, but with that, the huge growth becomes a massive um, gap in terms of the quality of service that comes from retrofit coordinators and assessors. Some are more geared towards providing um, support for grant programs, which is heavy compliance focused. Um, if you were to see some of the outputs, you might be a bit shocked that people are making decisions on what to do with people, people's homes with grant funding. Um, all the way to people who are very experienced, so kind of probably what Nick and Graham are providing, where they're very much more bespoke and tailored towards the self-funded or, or non-grant funded uh, market, so much higher quality of service. And what we do is we go through that process of finding uh, retrofit assessors and coordinators that are more tailored towards uh, the self-funded market and able to provide a really good quality of service. But it takes a while to go through that process um, and that's exactly what we're focused on. The second pool of suppliers that we work with as well is, is those installers. So they can be contractors or individual install installers. Um, and I've, I've described a little bit the process that we've been through. So we look for past 2030 accreditation. We're supporting some of those businesses that are going through that process as well to go and become accredited for that. Um, but generally we look a little bit broader um, for high quality installers that have the right quality management systems. They have the right accreditations. They've got case studies and can demonstrate they've done it well before we invite them into our, our supply network. So we do quite a lot of that work. Bandwidth can be an issue, but um, we're treating our suppliers as partners, communicating with them and, and giving them oversight over the demand um, that they're looking to get and building building with them as well at the same time. So if I could paraphrase what you've said in, in a, a perhaps a less polite way, there have been a lot of people coming into the industry recently, but perhaps the quality, especially where it's responding to the availability of grant funding, the quality hasn't been quite what we might have hoped. In, in some instances, I think there's a lot of people who want to do well but haven't necessarily been given the mentorship that's needed to do the job well as well. So we're also playing that role in right. giving them the resources to, to upskill. Um, just because you've done a course doesn't mean you're necessarily ready to go out into the world and, and do the job. So we do that job as well of pairing people up with more experienced coordinators so they can get more experience before they, before they hit the road. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned the Retrofit Academy, which um, is not far far from here and, and would have been here apart from, I think they're receiving awards at, um, at a big industries um, conference in, in, um, in London um, next, in the next couple of days. But um, it's good to have the Retrofit Academy in, in, in Stafford. And um, also we will be talking later, um, I know Serena is going to be talking about how they help fund um, the, the retro, Retrofit training. But brilliant. Well, that's a great, great introduction. Thanks, Becky. And perhaps, um, Charlie, if we can um, move, move on, on to you, and then you can talk to you.
I feel like more on tour here. This is my second gig of the week. Yes. <laughs> and I did, actually, I did actually get accused of doing retrofit a stand-up in Berry on Wednesday night. Um, so how many retrofit experts does it take to change a light bulb? Well, it's more than about the light bulb now, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Unless it does counsellors. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll not go there. So, um, your home better is, is a procured <coughs> thing by, uh, by the Great Majesty of Vinyl Authority. So, sadly, if you haven't got a German postcode, you can't use the freebies that come with it. But hopefully there's some lessons learned from it, because not all of them are positive. And actually, frankly, having family background in the West Midlands as well, I suspect you guys may well be able to sprint forward. And actually, sitting in Staffordshire where you are, you're halfway between the two. So you may well end up with the best of both worlds. We're made up of a whole load of different people because we need a systemic intervention to make retrofit work. It's not just about a contract, it's not just about the calculation, it's an entire range all the way through. So we try to assemble people to, to do the whole thing. Um, our basic premise is that zero carbon retrofit is possible and it can be affordable if we can get all our ducks in a row. And so the idea is get space heating down to somewhere near the UK Green Building Council's target of 50 kilowatt hours per square metre per year which is quite a long way below the 160 to 200 to probably 250, given where we are, that some of you are probably having to deal with at the moment. But it can be done, and it's an awful lot more fun to do it this way properly. But maybe not all at once. And, but we can do things that make houses an awful lot better, hence the name. So we don't need to knock these houses down. Those people say, oh, there's not enough value in that house, we're going to have to knock it down. May trigger me slightly. Um, but I'm in a polite company, so I shan't say what I would normally say in those instances. Um, but it's not a strongly held point of view, though, Mark, honestly. Um, yeah. uh, but, but you see what I mean? And um, Because um, a new house is between 50 and 80 tonnes of carbon dioxide to make one. And so don't knock it down if you don't have to. Um, and we can do the internal insulation. That picture's not as grand as I wanted it to be, but you can see my mate John there rebuilding the cornices. So this picture in the middle is post-retrofit, despite the fact that it looks exactly as it did. We've even done the wind reveal so that when she, when she saves up the cash to replace the awful plastic that's in there at the moment, she can put the windows back where the sashes used to be. Um, lofts, don't forget the platform. If you're going to top your loft up from the couple of inches you've got between your rafters at the moment, you stick some legs underneath it, they're freely available. Um, maybe put a room in the roof in while you're there because you can get some more space and make that box room into more than a box room because you can put a sleeping deck in while you're doing the retrofit. Um, but also, I've been asked to have a look at a new house. He's just spent £17,000 on triple glazed plastic <laughs> new windows, but they've put them halfway through the outer leaf of the brickwork. So as you can see by that deep purple picture there, he's basically got mould growing within three months of having the new windows put in. As you can imagine, just a bit miffed. Um, and then while I had the camera out, I had a look, and he's got tartan on his lot in, in his roof for a thermal image, because whoever laid his loft roll mm -hmm. just went, oh, I've got a bit left over, I'll just shove that in there. So there's these enormous gaps where the heat's weeing out of everywhere. Um, floors. Um, sometimes they're very difficult to get under. Um, sometimes there's no space under them. Sometimes they're solid. Mm -hmm. uh, where you can get under them, there's a lovely product, a beautifully called Passive Purple, which is an air tightness membrane you paint on. And because it's above your head, you paint yourself a fetching shade of purple while you're at it. Um, new windows, if you can afford them, are definitely the way to go. But blimey, they're expensive now. 68% rise in window prices in the last two years, which has made me a little sad. So the one, the triple glazed windows on our little display downstairs. They're about fitted and with the VAT, because for some reason you have to pay 20% back on them, they're about £950 a square metre, which is a rather nasty surprise. Um, so refurb them is the other option, um, but it doesn't work that well. If you're chasing a particular <coughs> thermal target or you're wanting to get the drafts a long way down, actually we've done the staff beads, the parting beads, replaced the casements, and all sorts, and still when the wind blows, you can still feel that wind coming in. So we've then used little bits of magnetic plastic on top of that, so we've got kind of poor person's triple glazing now. Um, there's a piece of that downstairs as well. But don't forget that I won't bore you about the cold bridging, because you've already been um, informed about those now, but there's the pictures. And the air tightness is the other one, so what you quite often find is they come hand in hand. If you've got a gap in the building, you'll get that nice smudge so the one above Mark's head is underneath my back kitchen door. Uh, although, cruelly, the one right in the top left, top right-hand corner is actually the freezer. And that's a 3A rated freezer, but there's a nice little cold patch underneath it, so it's obviously leaking a bit around the seal. Um, 
You do have to do the ventilation. The new part F of the building regulations downloadable from the planning portal if you're feeling trouble sleeping. Um, it's a great document because we've now had to double the amount of air you get into the house. You've got to let it in somewhere. That's a current ventilation unit, not for the financially faint-hearted, but actually quite handy. But there are intermediate options. I'm not going to have the time to talk about them now. Max out your PV. It's a no-brainer. At, at, at 40 odd p a kilowatt hour, 34 p, depending on which tariff you're on. It's just a no-brainer. Generate it, but put a battery in, store it while you're there. I'll come on to some of the financing of that in a minute. Mm -hmm. Heat pumps, um, as Becky said, don't do it first, because you'll end up with one twice the size of the one you wanted. And also, the fundamental wisdom about a heat pump is, and as the Lithuanian heat pump controller for hours told us, is you leave the heating on most of the time. You don't have the two hours in the morning and the three hours in the evening because your house is so leaky that the temperature is going to plummet the moment you do it and you've spent the, the, that two hours warming the pigeons on the roof. Um, you basically have to insulate your house to a point first and then leave the heating on for longer, but then it does work. The seven, I don't know where the 17 degrees bit came from. Ours zubs around at a fairly happy 20 degrees most of the time. And that picture in the middle ended up being a reenactment of Passchendaele by the time they had to try and reconnect all of the pipes. It was, it was very, very, very convincing, but that's the unit on the left there. That heats the whole house. Some lovely people in London should be bringing out an exhaust air source heat pump at some point this year, which will do everything in one box. Um, well, while you're there, you can also do some of the nice things. Um, the mayor in Greater Manchester wants retrofit to be seen as home improvement, which lights my candle, because then I can do the nice bits. If you've stuck eight inches of EWI on the side of the building and the gate fell off when you looked hard at it anyway, you get the chance to make a new one. And because we've enclosed the soil stack in some nice UK grown larch, you get to make a nice gate while you're there. The customer on the right there had the whole house retrofit and then went, Charlie, can you get my loft to be usable? Please. And so we did some fairly heroic restructuring of his loft to get that one on the right in there. Um, and they don't have any radiators up there, um, and that, they're three years in uh, because we did it to, the, to a proper standard while we were there. And I had a lot of laughs. But I've also had quite a lot of laughs ret retrieving some old trades. Curb skirting boards above Becky, and this one here built myself a steamer because they've had the flat roof redone as people do on bays and they never do it properly and think silicon is a long lasting seal. So we rebuilt the, the, we rebuilt the freeze. Um, and then you'll notice the windows don't have a horizontal bit because we went for inward opening tilt and turn windows so that you get more light in. And then we had them actually slightly custom built so we could join them together and not have those enormous great big plastic bars around your bay that mean you end up with a tiny little slot of light off each one. So that that's a before and after. Uh, quite proud of that, really. Um, but we also got to try modern methods of construction, and I think that's a thing we need to have a look at if we're going to make this roll out at some scale. So I laser scanned the room. That guy in the pink shirt has a very big CNC router, and we built the floor cassettes off site and then employed some strong people to get them into, site, into place for us. We also built the dormer off site, so we only had to have the roof open for one day. Obviously, the law of sod is that they absolutely tipped it down that night and the water did still get in, but we tried. Um, this one I'm quite chuffed with though, because it meant we took the entire bay off and put uh, up to that refurbished roof um, and put the new one back in because we pre-built the curved um, pieces ready to receive the insulation so the whole thing could be stacked on. It wasn't finished in the day, but it was secure in the day, which is quite a laugh. And then this is where I really get, that's the staircase. Not part of a retrofit per se, but you can do those while you're there. It's the, while I've, got, while I've found a builder that's competent, let's just keep him here and not let him go. <coughs> we've been working on one house on and off for three years. She just won't let me, uh, let me go and do another job. So we've done a staircase into a loft. We've done a, a UK brown oak kitchen. Um, so they're the things you can do while you're there. And then obviously it is more than just housing as well. These are former weavers' cottages in the northern quarter. We reduced their space heating demand by 60%, but had a lot of fun with the staircase as well while we were there. But back to the job in hand. What is a zero carbon retrofit is the first question. How far to zero do you want to be? Do you just want lots of shiny things? Because let's face it, they are quite fun watching the little machines go bing, to quote John Cleese from about 1975. Um, there is the EPC of C, and then the grid will decarbonise magically and everything else will be fine. Actually, not a bad strategy had it not been for Vlad's adventures in Central Europe, where we've then ended up with stupid energy bills. So number two doesn't do enough about fuel poverty, in my view. So the two I chase are three and four. There's a thing called regulated energy. If you've um, bumped into a DEA, they will talk to you about the regulated energy. That is your heating, lighting, and hot water. I think it also powers your fans, um, <laughs> and, um, or some of them. That's number three, so you could get that to zero. But the goal for me is, let's get our houses to the point where all the energy we need comes of our roof in a year. That feels like proper zero to me. Um, 
And then you've got your carbon cost, coughs and comfort. I'm sorry about number three, but I couldn't work out the alliteration for something to do with health that began with C, because I'd already got carbon comfort cost. Um, anyone thinking of anything, cardio would be a bit too techy. Somebody mentioned this earlier about, if you, some of you just maybe want to do a bit. The council that we have been arguing for, and in fact we argued for it in the Beyond Decent Homes report for SHAP in 2009, still on their website, um, is do the measures in, in such a way that they stack up. So if you are just going to do the floor because you're bored of cold feet while, you, while you're watching Netflix, but do it to a level that means that you can achieve that zero carbon target later. And so you stack them up, and there is a bit of a digest of the, uh, of the sorts of performance values very, very wide bracketing cost because it depends whether you're in a tiny bungalow or a mansion and it depends whether you get a builder that knows their own onions or one that's going to fleece you because I'm afraid there's an awful lot more of the latter than there are of the former at the moment. Um, this is how the PV and the battery works. So you should be able to say on an average install, we've got permission from Electricity Northwest to go all the way up to five kilowatts. Not formally, but they're going to nod it through. I think you're Western Power and Distribution. Are you WPD down here? Yeah. 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 They're, they're nearly there. Um, lean on them a bit. So you can save 570 quid on straightforward self-consumption, and that's not even the 50% they claimed you'd get, because actually achieving that is really difficult. Um, but then you put the batteries on, so you save another 500 quid, especially if you've got a heat pump. Um, then move to a time of day tariff, so you can charge the battery even when the sun hasn't been out, because you can use the 7.5p overnight to make sure you've got electricity when it's 40p during the day, because you ended up with that tariff. And then the thing we're about to start literally instructing the uh, 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 software developers on is collective trading. If we can get all the batteries working together, um, Flexitricity wants 600, we can trade the energy there and save another between 150 and 500 quid. So I just picked a number in between for this. But the point is that if you're then borrowing your money over 10 years at 5.5%, there's no net extra cost. So there is the... Um, because you've got a bit of light, you can't quite, yeah, can you read those tiny, thin, designery fonts in the background? Can you turn that light off? Just turn, hit the lights, which are normal. Yeah. That's a bit better. No. No. Then we can't see that. You just turn, see, hey, can, Vince, but can you better turn it back on? We can turn it back on when I finish. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. We don't oh, want... that's a fancy one, though. Yeah. There we go, now you can see it. So, what you've got at the top is that you need 2.9 megawatt hours a year for your actual thermal demand for your space heating. You need another 2.2 for your hot water. Um, sorry, no, that's the rest of the appliances. Um, and then you've got, so that's a total electricity demand of 7.2 megawatt hours a year. But you put the magic of a heat pump in and you reduce that 7.2 down to 4.2, which is what you can get off 5.3 kilowatts of PV on your roof, even in Manchester. And you're a bit sunnier down here, 30 miles further south. It's a bit, it's a bit less grim. Um, and then that's the regulated version where you maybe can't quite get enough PV on the roof. You can only get 3.8. So you could do regulated with a standard installation. And that's on the space heating demand of 50 kilowatt hours per square meter. It's not for the faint hearted cost wise. But I should come on to this in a second. That's about 56 grand to get to zero on a standard semi. Uh, this is one in Rugeley. Um, and so if, you've, if the average bill, and that's before we get to April, and it has another leap, um, is two and a half grand, the new energy bill post-retrofit, if it's been done properly and it was calculated with a full SAT model, which I should come on to, then you should be able to get to 280 quid, giving you 2,220 quid you could put somewhere else, the energy sales, if we got them to 300, you'd actually end up with no energy bill net. Obviously, you pay one, but you get it back again. And that then means you can redeploy that money to then pay for your retrofit. And this is one of the challenges I put before any public sector decision makers is 35-year loans at 4%, please, because then it all works. That's not a stupid number. It is, it's, a, it's a less sensible number than it was before Quartang and Trust broke the budget, uh, broke the economy back last <coughs> year, because the Public Works Loan Board borrowing interest rate leapt from 2.8% up to 6% almost overnight, and it's still down at 4, 4.5%. The, 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 the markets haven't, haven't yet trusted us with the, uh, with the, with the treasure yet. But it get, it's getting there. So the point is, you can make retrofit zero net cost if, and then you have a whole load of things that make the if. So what you're looking at is you're, you're looking at a, a cost curve. If you convert that to a loan curve, the blue and the red lines then, and the different costs of your loans, you're wanting to find the sweet spot. And that's the sweet spot on the expensive money, that's the sweet spot on the cheap money. If pink line, straightforward bill savings, 
first green line, um, PV and battery, because you have to pay for the extra, and then once you've got your energy trading, you're basically at zero, is, is how that works. Um, so what you're doing is you're taking your gas and your lecky and you're moving them into, into debt redemption, simply put. Or if it's your own money, you're moving it back into bringing your money back into your house. And in fact, the returns, if you were deploying your own capital, would be better than you carrying on paying as you were with all of those ifs that I said before. So we even do a whole little whole spreadsheet to show how it works. Because the other thing that you, pro if anyone's ever had a solar uh, proposition done, there'll be that bit where they're saying, well, it's going to repay itself in seven years. And then you look at some of the interest rates and you think, really? And you look at some of the repayments and you think, really? And, and the inflation, and you go, hmm. Um, so we actually modelled it so that you do replace the inverters, you do replace the panels, you do replace the batteries. And critically, because I'm one of those hippies that keeps saying use wood instead of plastic, after the 10-year warranty on the spray painted uh, 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 finishes over, theoretically you repaint your windows. I have actually put some in 15 years ago and they're still looking fine, but just so you're prepared. Um, but it does take a bit of work. So that's the retrofit bit finish, which was my, which was my, my brief. Um, I can stop there if, you, if we're out of time, which we are kind of. Or I could just whisk through the last few about the model. Whisk through the last few. Okay. So there's the customer journey. That's why there are 10 people in our scheme, because it's, you want to make sure that you've got them interested and talk nicely to them in ways they understand, creative concern. You want to make sure that you've got this all. You, we're starting to build the means of calculation. And then we want to get the battery storage incomes to help pay for it. We want to get Lendology, who are a microfinance provider, so we could capitalise a loan fund that they then loaned on in ways that we find friendly. And then Retrofit Works, we've imported into GM, because I, I know that obviously Ferd now, I'm hoping, will do the same thing, but Retrofit Works were the first to the table with a collective SME federated model to try and deliver Retrofit. It's still got some slightly fluffy corners on it, but in, in Cozy Homes Oxford, they've managed to get it to a point where it's making money. And what I said to GMCA was, we haven't got the demographics of Oxfordshire, except that, so how's about we have a model that's a bit similar. So we've got Beef for Box as well, brilliant company, just won the Ashton Award for training, 72 people, full-time employed, um, no zero as contracts, uh, living wage, and yet most of them are either people released from the NIP, long-term unemployed, or care leavers. So they've done an absolutely startlingly fantastic job, and they're lovely people to work with as well. But we do need to sort the maths out. So we've got these four offers in GM. So if you've got a GM postcode, so if you've got a mate with a GM postcode, just use their postcode and type it in, and you can have a play on plan builder. It isn't brilliant. Sadly, it uses exactly the same software that all of the people doing whole house plans currently use. It's just it's been rendered, it's been diagrammatized, so it's quite inaccurate. But actually, even our detailed whole house plans are still using the same software that you have your EPC done with, and anyone that's had an EPC and compared it to the reality of their home knows that if you don't have the, the really good DEAs, you have one of those other ones that Becky referred to, you can end up with a wildly fictional piece of work, and there is a big problem there. To make sure that when you invest in your home, you're putting the money where it's worth putting it, and not putting it where it doesn't need to be. Um, so we're about to start trying to create some more software, you can use this for free. So if you are wondering about some construction details, it's mentioned twice in past 2035 as well, so in retrofit terms, I'm famous. Um, <laughs> Retrofit.support, there's the URL in the top corner. It's, it's, it's treed so that you can find some details about how to do things. In some cases, there's even a cold bridge value worked out for it as well. The critical thing, as far as we're concerned, is we've got to get these additional... We've got to build what's called a revenue stack in the, in the social housing world, where we actually say, right, that's the amount of gas I'm saving, that's the amount of lecky saving, that's the amount of energy I'm bringing in, and that's the amount of extra revenue I'm bringing in. I've even heard somebody tell me I might be able to finally sell some carbon as well. And so we do need that finance vehicle. Our able-to-pay model is to get the cost of borrowing to be a distance from the charge for the lending so that we can cover the entire demographic. So, that it's, so whilst we are only employed to deliver to the what they call the, the, the able to pay, I'd quite like to make the willing to pay become the able to pay because quite a lot of people haven't got 50 grand down the sofa they weren't doing something with. But somebody did mention it before, we are desperately short of the workforce. If Greater Manchester is going to get to zero by 2038, we need 30,000 people on the tools Kind of nowish, certainly very quickly. Even if I do a slow start like that, we've got an exponential growth curve every year. And, and we've got a problem running the other way that Brexit kills basically a goodly proportion up. Between 10 and 20% of our construction workforce went, right, I'm off then. 
Um, and then you've got people my age still on the tools going, do you know what, I've really hurt my back, can I sit down for a bit now? And so you've got, a, you've got something like 10% of the workforce wanting to retire in the next few years. And what, the ex what, the, what Brexit has done is expose the inadequacy of our construction training regime because we've been essentially exporting the creation of skilled tradespeople to some brilliant education systems in Poland and it's exposed the slight paucity of ours that needs dealing with. Doesn't mean that there's abandoned hope, it just means we've got some work to do. So if you've got anybody, cousins, children, wanting to get excited, the reason I put those pictures of the sexy retrofits in at the start is that there's somebody thinking, I'm really bored of this call centre job, goes, I'm going to train as a chippy, because then I can use them. Um, and there's so many things we could do with Construction 2.0, because we could actually, because we're sending people to people's houses, there is no room for some of the stereotypical toxic masculinity that I have encountered up scaffolding. We can actually have that opportunity to create a workforce that is representative of the people into whom science people are going, so they feel comfortable with who is in their homes. And I just love the pride and satisfaction I get out of this when you've got a warm customer who's not dying because their house isn't killing them. And they're all things to play for. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Charlie. Now, if you're not out of breath from cycling from Manchester to here, you cert certainly are after that. That has been both inspirational, slightly daunting, and, uh, and inspirational at the same time. I like that. Um, we, we do have time for a couple more questions. Couple more questions. Charlie said we are running slightly late. Do we, do we have any questions from the audience, or do we continue the conversation afterwards? Um, <coughs> I can. Uh, yes, of course, Becky. Maybe first to Dan because he's on the stage as well. So. You've heard a bit what we're building at Verb now, what Charlie's been working on for years as well with Your Home Better. So first to Dan and then to the audience. So you're obviously here because you're interested in doing this to some extent your own home. What is it that's your main blocker? What is the thing that you're worried about? I just want to hear from the audience as well to get your perspective and I would be surprised if your concerns weren't shared with other people. Just to head of the lunch so you can have conversations with other people in this community as well. Yeah. But I hand over to Dan. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say... That, like you were saying, you referred now, that idea that there is a some sort of independent project manager who will at least advise you, that, that's hugely valuable to me. Um, it seems so daunting to search out the information to find out what you should be doing and having a, an experienced project manager essentially to guide you, even if you're not actually employing them directly to do the project management, once the work is in, 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 in train, it's a, it's a backup, it's having a, a, it's a, it's a reassuring um, helper for your project. And that's, that's really huge about it. Yeah. So, uh, so how many of the audience are actually looking at doing anything serious on, on their house? Um, right, uh, quite a quite a few. I love this audience. Yeah, it's no, it's it's good, isn't it? It's, it's good. And, and um, what's, uh, what, what is the main blocker? Is it just cost or is it trusted? A anyone want to volunteer? Uh, I think it's quite bewildering as to what's actually out there. And it's a lot of it's new technology that we don't really understand. We don't know how it's going to work. We're thinking, well, we should move away from gas. So we want to switch to electric because that can be renewable, that's better for the environment. But then you think, well, is hydrogen around the corner? No. Do we rip out the gas and hydrogen comes in? It's, if you go down the wrong road, it's a bit like VHS and beta Max, you've invested your money and got it completely wrong. And you end up probably having to do it again. It's trying to find out what's out there, who can actually advise us as the best way to go. Because we've all got limited resources. We want to spend it wisely. We want to do it in the environment. It's, it's trying to sort the wheat from the chat really, that, that's the big issue. There's nobody outside of the vested interest positions of the fossil fuel industry and those people with a couple of trillion quid's worth of pipework under our roads mm -hmm. that yes. want to sell us hydrogen. If you actually do the maths, it doesn't work. I have tried to do the maths. I saw someone I'm working with is very keen on hydrogen and I keep doing the maths and I can't make it work. Yeah, um, if we just look to what's happened with the high net project, which is very public, mm. every single person in that in those villages have said they don't want it mm. for optionality, but also safety concerns. So I think that has pretty much put the nail in the coffin for hydrogen going for domestic heating. Uh, well, on, on that particular village, I mean, uh, what, what, what were their fears legitimate or were they? Yeah, I think, so their main feedback was that they've been told a story from the local net gas network provider um, that 
it would be safe and there would be these savings and so on. And then they did their own independent research. They couldn't find a single scientific article that said that recommended hydrogen for domestic heating. And they said that if there are no independent sources which tell us that this is a route, then we don't trust what somebody with vested interests mm -hmm. is going to tell us as well. So they, they did their own research and, yeah. Um, yeah, they came to their own conclusions, thankfully. Cadent have enormously deep pockets for comms. Yeah, yeah. indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, uh, I, yeah. Hi. Interesting, we've got PV at the moment. We're really happy with that, but it's not going to produce five. It's, you know, on a good day, it's going to be three plus. And we're looking at uh, heat pumps. But it, the, the two things for heat pumps is that we're told people who've got them aren't happy with them because they don't produce enough heat. I suspect that's the use rather than the, the technology. But when we spoke to uh, installers, they're always telling us the same thing, really, which is if you just wait another year and it'll be much better and cheaper. And if you just wait another year, it'll be better still and cheaper. And it's, it's almost like the industry is kicking the can down the road, you know, rather than the, the kind of where we are. So I don't, I don't really know what to invest in. But if you imagine you're a gas safe plumber, you spent two and a couple of grand getting yourself certified to be a gas safe plumber, and then some bright spark says, oh, here's a new thing for you to spend a fortune getting trained in. Oh, and by the way, let's, let's forget home information packs and all the other false dawns over the last 20 years. You can forgive installers for being just a tad sceptical about it at this stage. I think, unfortunately as well, the grant regime is normalising some absolutely yeah, yeah. daft numbers on price. So I've, I've heard people try and convince me that it's 16 grand to fit a heat pump when I know that I can pick the unit up for four grand. I need to pay the geezers fitting it about two grand. So where's the other 10 going? Rhetorical, because we all know. Um, and so, although to be fair, some of it is compliant. So, but I think it does need proper design. It does need, going back to what I suspect Nick might have said, but I'm afraid I didn't quite cycle fast enough to hear it. You need to make sure that your retrofit performed to target. This is the other reason why we do need to move away from using um, a, a property sales tool for analysing people's forecast energy use, which is RDSAP. <coughs> and it's, the RD stands for reduced data. We need to get to the full SAP or even the passive house planning package, but that's for the that's for the uh, that's a level up that we may not need to go to so that you can actually make sure that your house performs to target so you do also need a retrofit coordinator that as becky said is at the end where they knew their onions so they didn't let some spread bury some some shocking cold bridges in the wall before you came by to inspect it so that you don't get the underperformance because that's the other thing is that if you've been told you blow this money your house will perform this well and it doesn't that's when your heat pump doesn't work and then you do have to leave it on for longer just to support what Charlie said, just a few years ago, before the heat pump grant was um, introduced, I used to be a commercial consultant in energy, and the numbers we were receiving on average for heat pump installation was about six, seven thousand pounds. Now that's twelve, thirteen, because it has been inflated with that grant program. So, plenty of calls to government to re-evaluate how they're using that funding to stimulate the market is happening at the moment. Your point around it's not performing again. This comes to there's a market that's growing, and there's a massive swathe of skills and ability in what's installed. Um, some, I think there's a gentleman asking, does it get to 17? There's things that need to be considered, like some um, houses can be properly designed if there's um, a header system in the, in the heat pump, but it's that level of expertise and whether that, is it a sole trader or is it somebody who's in a larger business that can benefit from the experience and deal with homes that others, sometimes those edge cases as well. Um, on the cost um, side of things, unfortunately, we only have one heat pump manufacturer in the UK, Kenza. Um, everything else we import from Italy and Germany, pretty much. So that means that in terms of the costs to us in the UK for heat pumps, there needs to be a lot done with that supply chain to help bring the costs down to us from four grand down to two, two and a half. Um, but good news, um, if you are looking for a heat pump, there's two places that you might want to go and have a look to get a price match. Octopus and British Gas are currently at a, a pricing war at the moment where they've decided to add a loss making to the South to help improve um, the interest in heat pumps um, uh, I think they're now at two and a half thousand pounds and they had a bit of a, a war on a matching them bring it down a hundred pound each time so if you are looking at it there might be a good route to getting <coughs> quite a significantly cheaper they're not going to lose money because that's including the boiler upgrade scheme okay so it's seven and a half oh. grand they're still making a few bulb they, but what they are actually at least doing is throwing <laughs> a gauntlet down to the rest of those trying to price gouge so at least it's a, it's a, it should create an adjustment to the market, but let's not let's not paint them too rosy. They're, they're still being spiny capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to say on heat pumps, there are 600,000 in the UK installed already, which many people aren't aware of. In Europe, it's about 40 million. 
Mm. Um, so it's quite new in terms of the public debate and the public discourse, but actually it's a well-established technology and the hardware has been around for years and years and years and years. And the first ever domestic heat pump was actually in the UK in the 1940s. Um, so it's, and we've all got one in our home in the fridge. So it's their design, right? Yeah. Brilliant. So I did a talk the other day to about 20 people, and there were six heat pumps in the room. Nice. So there were two, two ground source and four air source, and they were all over the moon with them. So the, there are scare stories that will always propagate our media far more than the people who actually have a really good experience. I, I love my ground source heat pump. I want my, my garden back, but it'll come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just as a local person, I'll make a comment. We've had a heat pump in an old stone-built house for 12 years, ground source heat pump, and it's absolutely brilliant. So don't believe any of the rubbish about it won't heat your hot water enough. We run a house at um, 90 degrees comfortably everywhere, um, and the efficiency is amazing. It's, it's a big house, it's an inefficient house, and it's got a 3.6 kilowatt heat pump. Really? It does brilliantly. I and mean, we have it serviced regularly. I had the engineer in last month and said, well, 12 years, you know, is, is it getting a bit creaky? And they ran all the parameters I, and said, that's got a lot of years of life yet. So if you compare that with a gas boiler yeah. or an oil boiler and, and the servicing and the replacements and the cost. So brilliant technology. But, but it's just not played up enough. I agree. But you do want to reduce, ideally, you want to reduce your space heating demand first. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You don't need to do the whole retrofit. The, the, I this was a, a big renovation yeah. project, and so we got the insulation right. Yeah, I mean, if you don't do that, it's a disaster. But the, so I, I've calculated you need to do about half of that whole house retrofit before you put the heat pump in, <coughs> and then you can readjust the hours as you finish it, but at least you can get in there. I think the, the worry is, is that people have got conventional radiators and are being told a heat pump will run this. And, and, well, and by equal measure, they're being be told that... Well, and there's another myth being peddled the other way, which is trying to justify the twelve to sixteen thousand pounds, mm. which is we will have to upgrade your circulation pipes and your emitters, and I'm saying no, do the retrofit first, so that despite the fact yeah. the water's only is up around your radiators at thirty five to forty, because you've reduced the overall space heating demand, you can still get enough heat out of your radiators, but you are getting half the heat out of your radiators once you're running a heat pump, and so we, there is some, so there are some bits in that. I think it's gone the other way since you had your debate. Just, just one sh small piece of advice is, if you're not sure whether a heat pump will actually work in your house, if you have a gas boiler already, if you turn the flow yeah. temperature Ooh. down to 40 degrees C on a cold day and see how warm your house is, yeah. that will give you a kind of indicator mm. as to whether you need to upsize your rats or whatever. Um, I mean, it's it's a simple like, way. People like that for a few days. Yeah, let it run for a few days. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, it's a, it's a great easy test, isn't it? It's a good indicator. Yeah. It's an excellent tip. Yeah. Why did that not occur to me before? Thanks, Brian. <laughs> 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 Can I just say, yeah. that we did a, a low energy retrofit in Macclesfield, which we finished in August, and we got an AEBC, which we were thrilled with. Mm. We also had open days where we had people come and have a look. And again, it was preaching to the converted, but the, the reiterating where the barriers are, it was people came, they were really confused. Should I just put a heat on them? Probably 70% of the people that came. And then they didn't understand about fabric first. So it's really about getting that information out there, not just people like this, because I've talked to other transition groups and stuff like that. But how you, how you get that out there, and the government doesn't, talk about fabric first, they just talk about low carbon, which is getting everyone off the gas grid, and they don't, and you don't understand that low energy doesn't necessarily mean low carbon either. So there's a lot of, um, <coughs> lobbying is the wrong word, but recommendations that um, there should be a national retrofit co comms campaign, the mm -hmm. similarly funded as the smart meter campaign was, over the same time period as well. So. Yeah. SHAP, uh, Charlie and I are both involved with the Sustainable Housing Action Partnership. That came from our system change for retrofit recommendations. The um, National Retrofit Hub that's being set up as well came off some recommendations from the Construction Leadership Council. So I completely agree, it's just when the funding comes in um, and hopefully with the starting of the Energy Efficiency Task Force, another one, mm -hmm. um, this will actually kick off getting the funding in place to support that. But I completely agree, it's really required. But I think in the meantime, towns like Leek are actually in a really good position to be able to audit your own capacity 
to make change and see what you've got in, in the town already. Because the great thing about smaller towns, you tend to identify quite, quite locally and you can start to trust people. That's one of the things I find about working with people from that there London versus working with people from the north where like, even Manchester's just a socking great village. But actually when you're in a proper town, you can actually go, right, who have we got in the town that knows their way around some of this engineering? They might even be retired and they might just fancy jenning themselves up on some of this so that you can describe <coughs> some of those myths just at a kind of almost hobby level. That's the sort of thing you guys can do. But you could also then maybe find some funding to just audit your, or even just do it anyway, Who's had a builder in they trusted? So if you just had an EPC of A, was the builder any cop? Can they be down on a register? Will they come this far without getting a nosebleed because there's a hill between them? Um, and you can start to see who you, can, who you can start to put into a supply chain. And then you talk to Graham about who's any cop on the retrofit coordinator side. And before you know it, you've got some of those things. And maybe at that point, you do talk to Ferb now, or you talk to Retrofit Works or whatever, probably Ferb now this week. And then you start to build some capacity to make the change. Because I love the number of hands that went up that said you want to make a difference and do it now. And let's face it, our agency over the climate change catastrophe is our own homes first to act as the trailblazers for making it work. Yeah. I know there are more questions, but I'll, I'll unfortunately, panel discussion later, haven't we? We, we have, we have, we've got, we, we can fit, fill, feed some of these questions into the panel at the end. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we do have to have a, a lunch break. Um, I'd um, just like to. Uh, before I go, ask one question. Uh, Dan, you, you heard a lot in response yep. to your worries. Are you less or more worried? Uh, <laughs> definitely less worried. Um, it's just, yeah. it's, 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 it's having a helping hand to guide you through that. The guy there said about it. just the, mm -hmm. the misinformation. The, uh, just there's so much out there and so much doubt. And it's new stuff for everybody. Um, we, you know, gas boilers have been around for a long time. They're well-established technology. They're, they're, so that it's relatively easy to find a decent gas fitter to fit you a new one, but if you want a heat source, ground source heat pump, that's a whole different matter. That's a whole new technology for everybody. It's awful, awful, awful. Uh, ground source heat pumps are lovely, but you're not going to get yeah. much change out of 20 grand. Because no. really? no. no. someone has to come and dig an enormous but hole only, in your garden. But only some people have got suitable, you know, yeah. suitable yeah, we, we've had an air source heat pump. Mm. Which basically is only heating one room, the room that we want to use the most. We, you know, the kitchen, dining area where we want to be able to get up in the morning and it's a warm room. We can stay in there for an hour or two before we go out for the day. And yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. It costs us less than two thousand pounds to get fitted. Is that air to air? Air to air. Air to air. Yeah. 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 And we've got an air to water in the summer. Now, I do the same thing. I heat half the house and not the rest. And uh, the heating bills are no, no bigger than they were last year. Even though the unit prices have doubled. Yeah. It's great to hear that from people who've got mm. their own experiences because yeah. we can espouse the benefits on the stage, but it's, yeah. it's your lived experience. That which was is the most important. That's an air to water. So it's heating the radiators. I had to change all the radiators from old ones to double new ones. Um, didn't go for the underfloor heating. And um, uh, also do the insulation. But, uh, and the whole thing was uh, <coughs> quite as cheap as yours, but it wasn't very expensive. Yeah. And we like those simple, those those um, those simple solutions because once you start digging around here, Charlie, mm. you tend tend to hit cold seams mm. or. Yeah, well, that's why boreholes are lovely. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the latest technology on the boreholes is they can sheath the borehole as they go, so even if you advert, even if you hit adverse geology, you can still get the heat exchanger pipe in. You don't need to do the coils and the slinkies horizontally. You can go straight down. Yeah. So most of the heating in our house is from our uh, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. So Ooh, essentially the people that appliances <laughs> in the house actually provide the heating for the house. And it's very, very small top up from our heat pump, which is mainly used to heat the hot water. Nice. And one day we hope to come and see see your. I know there has been, a, you know, it has been possible to view your your house. I think, I think, but um, one day hopefully we'll, we'll be able to come and come well, and see the, it. The tenants will have to let you in. Then. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. Ab absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, we we're just moving on to a brief bre break before we um, go into our um, <coughs> next session, which is from the University of Kiel, um, Zoe Robinson. But I'd like to ask you to just join me in thanking my three panellists. Thank you very much.